Well, good morning, beloved ones, and thank you for tuning in today. I'm excited to see what God has for us today from His Word. But you know, I've been thinking over this past week that we're coming upon the one-year anniversary when we first had to close down uh, our services, close down meeting in the building. March 15th of last year was our last service in the building, and that lasted all the way until May the 24th of last year. And even now, some folks have not been able to come back and meet in the building. They're in a higher risk category, a higher risk situation, and we certainly understand that. And thinking back on that time, while in one sense it may not be an anniversary we want to celebrate, we do want to celebrate God's goodness and His faithfulness toward us because wouldn't we say over these past 12 months, God has been good. God has met our needs individually and congregationally every step of the way. And so I think back on that time and I say all praise unto Him. Well, let's go before the Lord in prayer as we begin today. Father, thank You for Your goodness toward us. You are full of mercy and grace and kindness. And we've seen that over and over again these past 12 months. And Father, I pray for those who have not yet been able to come back and meet in the building. And I know it's their heart's desire to be able to do so. And I pray especially for them today that you would, you would give them encouragement and strength of faith and endurance and even joy in these days. And Father, would you reunite us together soon? And we ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. 
thank you, Christina. And today we turn back over to Ephesians chapter 2 where we will finish the chapter today. You will remember that last week we saw Paul liken the church unto a body. He explained how what looked like two separate groups, Jew and Gentile believers, aren't separate at all. But through Christ's life and death, they have been brought together as one. One new man, Paul says, one new body. So that you don't have Jewish believers and Gentile believers. You just have the saints, the body of Christ, with Christ as the head. Well, today we're going to see Paul describe the church not as a body, but as a building. And not a brick and mortar structure, but one building, one whole building made up of the people of God people that God is fitting together and building together with Jesus Christ himself as the cornerstone. So last week we saw the church as a body. This week we're going to see the church as a building. And let's just jump into our text and see what God has for us today. We're going to read verses 19 through 22. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Well, here's where we're headed today. Verses 19 through 20 we're going to see the status of the Gentiles, specifically that they are fellow citizens, fellow heirs, and foundationally grounded upon God's Word and Jesus Himself. And then in verses 21 through 22, I'm entitling those verses the sanctuary of God, and we're going to see that the church is a holy temple in the Lord and a dwelling of God in the Spirit. So let's just start with this idea of the status of the Gentiles as Paul describes it here. And, and we need to take just a moment here to give a reminder of some important context. And then we'll get into the specifics of verse 19. But some important context. The church in Ephesus, like many other places and churches in the New Testament, started with Jewish people. Jewish people who believed that Jesus is indeed the Messiah and that Jesus is Lord. They believed Jesus is the promised one they had been looking for and hoping in. He's finally arrived and they trusted in Jesus the Christ. But then in these places there would eventually come a time when the good news of Jesus, the Messiah, would also be proclaimed to Gentiles. And as we know from the scriptures, many of the Gentiles believed Jesus is the Messiah. They trusted in Jesus for salvation. But then there became the question, how would these Gentiles be received into essentially this already existing fellowship of Jewish believers? I mean, just think of a real world scenario that must have played out in many of these places, in some form or another. You're a Jewish believer in Jesus the Messiah. You're meeting with other Jewish believers for fellowship and for worship. And then you have Gentiles who show up and say, you know what? We believe Jesus is the Messiah too. Well, there's the question. How are they received in? How are they welcomed in to the fellowship? Are they seen as outsiders? Are the Gentiles seen as strangers? Are they still called the uncircumcised? And what happens when they show up at the church potluck with meat sacrificed to idols and all of these other questions and hurdles and considerations? These had to be dealt with in the early church. Now Paul has already taught earlier in the chapter, this is what we looked at last week, the Gentiles who were far off, yes, they have now been brought near through the blood of Messiah. And Jesus himself is our 
peace. And he didn't leave us as two separate groups. He broke down that dividing wall of hostility and made us together into one new man, one new body. And we both have our access to the Father through one Holy Spirit. And then based on all of that, Paul goes on here in verse 19 to clarify even further the status of the Gentiles. He says, so then you, I think he's talking about the Gentiles, you Gentiles, notice what he says, you're no longer strangers. You're no longer aliens, outsiders, foreigners. Indeed, you are fellow citizens with the saints, which is to say, you Gentiles, you are of God's people. I mean, think about how amazing this is. Verse 12, remember we learned last week, at one time the Gentiles were excluded from citizenship in the people of God. Now, Paul declares, they are received in as fellow citizens. Fellow citizens with the people of God. Fellow citizens with the saints. Notice that language there. Fellow citizens with the saints. That's not just referring to living believers, but even the saints of old. So Gentiles are fellow citizens with Abraham and Sarah, Moses and Miriam, from Elijah to David. The Gentiles aren't foreigners anymore. They are of God's people. Not only that, Paul goes on to say they are of God's household. I've put this as fellow heirs. Paul's going to use that term later in chapter 3, fellow heirs. They are of God's household. Think back to verse 18 from last week. We learn there, in one Holy Spirit, we both have access to whom? To the Father. Pay attention to that language. We have access to the Father. The Gentiles too have been brought into God's house, not as slaves, not as servants, but as sons and daughters, having been adopted according to the kind intention of his will and having obtained an inheritance, as we learned back in chapter 1. And staying with verse 19, we learn here the status of the Gentiles. They have been foundationally grounded upon the apostles, and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. Now, let's just make this clear. The Jewish believers, th this is all true of the Jewish believers, but they would have already understood themselves in this way. They would have already understood themselves as citizens with the saints. They would have understood themselves as being of God's household and placed on this foundation of apostles and prophets with with Messiah as the cornerstone. I mean, the Jewish believers already knew Isaiah 28, 16. Behold, I lay in Zion a foundation stone, God says, a tried and precious cornerstone. Whoever believes in him will not be shaken. The Jews already knew all of this about themselves, but what Paul is saying here, the Gentiles too are citizens with the saints of God's household and built on that very same foundation of apostles and prophets with Jesus, the precious cornerstone. Let's think a little bit more in depth about this phrase, the foundation of the apostles and prophets. But let's dive into that just a little bit. Having been built on the foundation of apostles and prophets, who are the apostles? Well, the apostles we read about in the New Testament, these were eyewitnesses to the resurrected Jesus, and they were specifically commissioned by Jesus to go forth as eyewitnesses and give testimony to the good news of salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. The prophets, who are they? Well, taking these to mean the Old Testament prophets, these are ones who proclaimed the coming of the Messiah, and through whom salvation would come. So the prophets proclaimed Messiah is coming. The apostles proclaimed the Messiah is here. 
and we know who he is. We've seen him. He's Jesus. He's been raised from the grave. He's the very son of God. And by the way, even if you take the prophets here to be prophets from the New Testament who had the gift of prophecy, or Paul just talking about prophets in general, you're going to get to the same place. Apostles and prophets were those proclaiming and teaching about Jesus and, and proclaiming who he is and what he's like and his identity. So the point here is this. It's a long way of saying, but an important way of saying this. Being built on the foundation of apostles and prophets is not referring to being built on a specific individual, but rather we have been built on the foundational teaching about the Messiah and proclamation of Jesus that came through the apostles and prophets. Now, of course, we have the apostles and prophets teaching today recorded in its entirety in God's Word. So I would, I would think about it like this in terms of application for us today. Believers, Jew and Gentile alike, are built on this firm foundation of God's Word. That's the apostles and prophets for us today. Built on the firm foundation of God's Word. And supporting all of this is who? The chief cornerstone. Christ Jesus himself. We see this in verse 19, having been built on the foundation of apostles and prophets. That's the firm foundation of their teaching God's word. Christ Jesus himself supporting all of this, being the cornerstone. Jesus himself is not a ceremonial cornerstone. Like you see in some buildings, you drive by and you see a, a name etched in a brick at the bottom of the building. It's there for posterity's sake. That's not Jesus. Jesus is the load-bearing, precious cornerstone from whom the whole building gets its security and will never be shaken. This is the foundation upon which Jew and Gentile alike are built. Now, applying this out into our lives today, let me just say this. We have here, from verses 19 and 20, the markings of, the characteristics of the true church. The true church is comprised of the people of God built on right teaching from the Word of God with Christ Jesus himself and no one else being the chief cornerstone. That's important for us to get and to get a hold of and to understand because as you know, there are many false churches out there in our culture today. Places the enemy has constructed to maybe resemble a church, but in essence they confuse and mislead people unto eternal destruction. But when you know these true marks of the church, the false ones become easy to spot. So, you have Jehovah's Witness built on the New World Translation of the Scriptures and built on the Watchtower Track Society with Charles Taze Russell as the cornerstone. You see all of that and you know immediately, false church. You have the Church of Scientology founded on a book entitled Dianetics with L. Ron Hubbard as the cornerstone. You take all of that and you know immediately, false church. You have the Church of the Latter-day Saints built on the Book of Mormon with Joseph Smith as the cornerstone, false church. And the list goes on. And I don't say any of that with, with malice, but beloved ones with a heart of compassion to call people under the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, the only Savior in whom we have access to the Father and peace with God and forgiveness of sins and we are made of God's people. I mean, people in history have even tried to build the church on Peter himself. The truth is, the one true church is built on God's word and Jesus himself being the cornerstone and no one else. 
But what Paul is telling us here is the status of the Gentiles. How are they received in? The status of Gentile believers, it's just like the Jewish believers. Fellow citizens, fellow heirs, foundationally grounded upon God's Word and Jesus Christ Himself. Now that leads us into the last two verses, verses 21 and 22. I've entitled this section, The Sanctuary of God. I'm using the term sanctuary in the biblical sense to mean the holy place where God dwells. So notice, Paul goes on to say in verse 21, in whom, notice that at the beginning of verse 21, in whom, he's referring to Christ Jesus there. In Christ Jesus, the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. What a description of the church. Let's think big picture first, and then we'll narrow down our scope. Big picture, verse 21, Paul is simply saying this. These Gentiles, who are fellow citizens, fellow heirs, built on the apostles and the prophets and Christ Jesus himself, are not a separate structure. These Gentile believers are not their own entity who just happen to share a foundation with the Jewish believers. Indeed, in Christ Jesus, notice the language, the whole building, the entirety of the building being fitted together is growing into a singular temple in the Lord. That's important. Just like we didn't have two separate bodies of Christ, but Jew and Gentile believer have been brought together as one new body. In the same way, we don't have two separate buildings, if we're using that analogy of, the, of a building. We don't have two separate buildings. Jew and Gentile alike are one. One whole building growing into a singular holy temple in the Lord. And... As we drill down into some of the details here, notice verse 21, Paul says this entire building is being caused to be fitted together. The picture here is that God is taking the individual parts, Jew and Gentile, and joining them together, fitting them together as one structure. And this structure is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. So God fits the parts together into one structure and then he refines them into a holy people. He matures them into Christ's likeness. He grows them together so that they are likened unto a temple, the place where God's very holy presence dwells. Only it isn't a place we're talking about. It's a people. You take the universal church and the people who make up the church, and you can think about it this way. They are one holy, unified structure built on God's word with Jesus the cornerstone and in whom God dwells. What a high view of the church were given here. And, and this is what Paul goes on to clearly state in verse 22. By the way, if you're, if you're thinking about verses 21 and 22 together, I think 21 is put in language the Jews would understand. The church is a holy temple in the Lord. They would have known what that meant. Verse 22 is put in language the Gentiles can understand. The Gentiles may not have grasped that temple language and temple imagery, but they can understand this, verse 22, in Christ, in Jesus, you are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Think about it this way. The Holy Spirit of God fully and completely indwells the life of each believer. And... If all believers are being built together and joined together as one, 
What you have is the church, the people of God, as a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Put real simply, God, through His Spirit, resides in His people, a holy temple in the Lord. It's an amazing view of the church we're getting here. I want to close with three applicational points here. Taking what we're learning about the church and applying it out. First, I would say this. Based on what we're learning here, we can pretty quickly dispel a couple of popular misconceptions about the church. Sometimes people will describe the church as a man-made institution. This is something that human beings came up with so that they could collectively express their uh, their, their devotion to the Lord. It's a man-made institution. But from the language here, it's clear. God is the one who is causing us to be fitted together, built together. In other words, the church is God's construction. It's not man-made. It's God-made. Also, here's another misconception the church is not a religious organization. That's often how the church gets described, especially in secular, uh, in, in, in secular terms and secular viewpoints. The church is a religious organization. What we are learning here is absolutely not. The church is a holy temple in Christ Jesus and through the Spirit, the very dwelling place of God. Secondly, another point of application here. Think about this. If God dwells in his people, and we're learning very clearly here that he does, then the church, God's people, are not weak and powerless. God's people, the church, is not on the verge of disappearance or irrelevance. We are a people set apart by God on an unshakable foundation of God's Word with Jesus Christ Himself, the cornerstone. And the very Spirit of God resides in His people. There's no weakness here. There's no impotence here. In fact, Jesus said, the gates of Hades cannot prevail against the church. Finally, I know sometimes in local fellowships, we don't always live like we're a holy temple in the Lord. Let's just be honest about that. We can get caught up in sinful and petty things. But beloved ones, the failings of the local church, of the local fellowship, and we've all seen them, shouldn't cause us to abandon or to degrade the church, the body of Christ, the very dwelling place of God. The people through whom God is declaring His glory and His salvation. And I know some of you listening today may have been hurt by your experiences with the church in the past. And I do pray for healing from those hurts. And I pray that you would come to know the joy of being part of God's people and in a local fellowship. And may we as a local congregation here, may we as the church come to rely on and fervently desire this work we are told God is doing of growing us together into a holy temple, refining us more and more to be like Christ. Well, let's go before the Lord in prayer as we close today. Father, what an amazing view of the church you are giving us here, your people, built on your word, grounded upon your Son, and dwelt with your Holy Spirit. And Father, we thank you for Jesus, who has reconciled us to each other and unto you. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen.